Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Podcana episode 31. Not too, me- not too much news in regards to the metagame, but we're going to be revisiting our main topic from last week because we weren't able to make it to that, um, and that is how to prepare for events. Talking about things like expected metagame, proper testing, and the ins and outs of sort of the logistics of the day of. Like, how do you play a card game for 14 hours a day? You have to feed yourself. You have to acquire water and sustenance, all these kinds of things. Um, anyway, guys, did you have any... Ch- I know... <sighs> The biggest news I heard was actually from Kawa prior to the pod. He was like, oh, Raven just sent me this spicy steel amethyst deck list. Any other updates uh, in your life regarding Lakana outside of that? Uh, I mean, I cosplayed as Flynn Rider on on Sunday, <laughs> which was an experience. Uh, and my girlfriend cosplayed as Rapunzel. That was really fun. Uh, really embraced the, the Disney-ness mm-hmm. of the game. But um, it was fun. We finished our four-week... Uh, period of the league i won some pins i'm still playing amber steel for those of you who are interested um although i think i'm still pretty confident that ruby amethyst is like the go-to deck i would play if there was like a super super competitive event at the moment i think overall it's just really good into a lot of matchups besides that um i'm planning on going to one or two competitive events in the new year in europe uh there was a pretty big one announced in vienna i think it's uh Oh, I can't remember the, the name of the organizers who run it. It's uh, three for one trading. I know they, they do a lot of magic stuff, I think. And they did like some pre pre release stuff for Lorcana. I think Sasha was actually there, and um, Brendan, for yep. when they did the Lorcana stuff in Europe. So it's a pretty big event. I think first place is like six boxes, an enchanted Shere Khan, and the custom trophy, which, you know, just to see more, comp- more community events like this and like higher stakes is. Also really cool, but like the thing I'm most excited for obviously is when the, the official events start in Q2 2024. But besides that, yeah, it's not much has happened this week. I'm very much hoping to try and uh, you know, test some some new decks. You know, seeing this kind of amethyst steel list is exciting. Don't know how good it's gonna be, but you know, always trying to experiment with some some new and exciting stuff. How's your guys' week's been? Moyne, have you been able to play much or, or Brendan yourself? Huh? So, so last weekend I was able to to top my first like huge physical TCG event, which was Let's go. was a very good feeling. It was a one thousand player one piece event, and I can't wait to top like huge Lacana events too. <laughs> Hell yeah. Wait, so Hell did yeah. you what play uh, what place did you get? Uh, like third, fourth. So I lost semi final. Okay. Let's go. Yeah. Um. For those who don't know as well, uh, One Piece is a game that's primarily compensated in promo cards, and you can get some pretty crazy promo cards in that top eight. I remember I went to a One Piece tournament uh, casually. When I say casually, I was just there to see my friends. Um, I didn't actually play uh, regional here in, in Dallas, and one of my friends top eighted that as well, and it was like, I don't know, he made like $5,000 or something. <laughs> it's just like, it's crazy. Yeah. From, um, from, from this stream deck, top eight is like seven to 8,000 in cards. Yeah, crazy. A one thousand player tournament is a serious tournament. Uh, that's that's crazy. How many rounds of Swiss did you play? Uh, so it was a dream deck, and we played ten rounds of Swiss into <sighs> top thirty two cut, and mm. then top thirty two cut was best of three on on day two. How long was the first day of ten rounds? Mm, like eight hours around. Yeah, so, I think ten rounds is actually Six. not too bad. Um, I played I played twelve rounders and fourteen <laughs> rounders. <laughs> Ten yeah. rounds not too bad. What do you yeah. mean? Oh in the God. in the early days of Flesh and Blood, it was it was really the early days. So they didn't actually split it up between two days. Now they do they split up between two days or three at the World Championship. Mm-hmm. Um and we did twelve rounders uh in one day with top eight. So that was like I mean it took one with top eight in yeah. one day. So what? I flew to Auckland for the first crack uh construct tournament of Flesh and Blood. Uh, I think it took sixteen hours. My friend Sasha, who you know, won the tournament. So we were there for 16 hours. It, it ended at like 2 a.m. Started at like 10 or something. Bro. Yeah, it was uh, it was interesting. It's a, it's a good thing that we're talking about how to prep for events <laughs> this week. Cause, yeah, yeah I don't wild. know how you prep for that some one. People, <laughs> some people might be scared of, of something like that, but I, I think I might thrive on like 12 hour days. <laughs> I, I would like to see Moyen on a, on a 12, 14 hour Lorcana event. Yeah, I, I already want to see that. Mm. And Kala, you you won your league for the season. Or what do they even call it? Is it no, so it's like I, I don't know. So basically, yeah, it's a it's a twelve week league, and it's basically it's like three months between sets, right? Mm-hmm. And how 
I think how they do it officially is every four week period they give out pins or they they add up the points after four weeks and they reset out of the points for the next four weeks and so on and so forth. Um, and I think you give out the like lore counter and like one of the specific pins at the end. But we got like the I think it's the Winnie the Pooh Honey Wizard and the Rapunzel pins this week. So pretty much like I'm not gonna lie, I think like it's what we were discussing a while back, Brennan. Um, like if you just perform like really well, like if you like. 3 or 4 every week like obviously you'll do well but you still pick up a lot of points from all of this kind of oh where disney this and do like when i cosplayed i think my organizer gave me like three points instead of one because i because we obviously like actually turned up as the characters right like i don't know if you should be doing that or not but um realistically if you play well enough each week you bring like a somewhat decent deck and you actually just show up every week you'll have a, ch- a high chance of getting the pins and like i think it's whoever wins that four week period gets a choice of a pin and then three random players within that league uh who are there like on that final week will just get pins so like if you don't win it then you don't actually get the choice of pins and it's just randomly given out to other people so um i don't know some places do it differently i personally prefer like actually just getting the promos and pins for performing the best and playing the best because obviously we're like competitive players but also i can see why they do these other kind of um yeah. ways of doing it because like you know they're trying to get casual people to play the game and also the whole thing of like oh if you have judy hops and nick wild and play if you have two items and play on the same turn you get extra points it's like it's obviously trying to encourage people to play different decks and i understand that but yeah i mean every week at locals i for the for, for the four weeks except maybe the first one i played the same deck so yeah yeah i played uh back in chapter one i was playing at like multiple locals a week and they all had different structures um and one of them was more competitive than the rest and there were definitely some more competitive players that showed up to that one for that reason it usually took like four plus hours it was best of three um went through a bunch of rounds they were like streaming a table all that stuff and they put all the prizes to basically first and i went undefeated for four four weeks in a row and i remember getting all the promos on the fourth week i'm like wow this is toxic (laughs) i probably shouldn't do this Mm. to somebody else um but yeah they also had some stuff in regards to like if you had all the princesses on board you got like a point or something but you had to cash them in um so yeah yeah you have to like yeah i have to like call the guy over and be like oh i have these characters and play you know what yeah, I, mean? it's I, like, I, I never i never yeah. did it i never did it <laughs> um so at the end yeah. of at the end of the season i remember they were i got second i was like surprised in the league and it was based off my record and i was like uh, i told <laughs> it was just yeah you said it, yeah. Yeah. Mm. i was like 32 and one i was like oh okay <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, so we had some spoilers come out, but honestly, they weren't too interesting. I mean, nothing groundbreaking. The one I saw was the Sapphire is basically Phil. Um, what is it? It's like Phil, it's a super, and it has it has Ward, basically, right? Has Ward, has support, three cost, inkable, three, one, that quest for two. Uh, so I think a quest's for one more than Phil. I don't, yeah, I think Phil only quests for one. So quest for two has Ward, so it's better against... Uh, like the best thing at the moment in the meta is like what like turn one cinderella into let's storm rage on obviously you can't play this card till turn three but it still just dies pretty much to um grab your swords if there's no bodyguard stuff like you quest with it once like you you quest with it to give support to another character and then it's just dead if you, if your opponent has cards on the board so it's kind of i don't know it's it's fine but yeah like i don't really understand like lokana is very much a game we we're kind of talking about this a little bit earlier brendan that this rarity to power ratio is very strange to me like there's some super rare cards that are pretty good right like that you see in a lot of decks like ariel is super super good lady tremaine is super super good and then you have some super rare cards that uh are kind of questionable and even even rare cards as well like it's it's, funny you would uh, you would definitely i think you would be surprised at flesh and blood because flesh and blood is that times 10 um because it's all actually balanced off of like a specific like mathy number so not mm. only are the majestics and the supers like potentially uh not powerful but they they're just the same rate like at least in Lorcana, they're usually above rate they're usually like quantitatively sure, above sure. rate slightly the card mm. might still suck <laughs> because it just doesn't have a place in the metagame but they still are you know attempting to be powerful cards in, in, in quantitative value they are yeah, yeah, yeah sure yeah. sure sure but um yeah i mean you'll have that in every game i mean magic is the same thing where you just have like some some majestics or whatever they're just kind of they're 
They're not it. Um, they might be meant for multiplayer. They may be meant for a future meta, but it's just tools to play with. Some cards are overtly powerful. Anyway, let's get on to our spilled ink section because this week we're going to actually hit the main topic. Um, the first one is from Zeph Games. This is our mo- most upvoted comment. And Zeph also has a YouTube channel, which I watch quite a bit, does uh, deck text and stuff like that. Um, says, really like Moyne's comparison of Forbidden Mountain to a 06, uh, 06 that Quest for One it put into perspective. Uh, yeah. I think that's a way to look at locations. And we have another comment coming later talking about how locations are kind of just characters, but with downsides. That's why you get that big butt, uh, that zero six body. Um, and of course, there's going to be additional cards that synchronize with locations so you can get payoffs. But ultimately, they're very, I guess they are very interactable um, to an extent. At first, it was like, oh, here's this like passive gaining lore that you can't really blow up or anything. It's like, oh, wait, they're just tapped creatures. So, yeah, not as powerful as we thought. Yeah. It's my favorite comment of the week. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's a great way to look at it, though, honestly. Like, I think, like, because it was funny, like, when we talked about it last week, it's exactly what you said, Brandon. Like, we, we were like, oh, my God, our location's OP, and the Moyen's like, <laughs> well, if you look at it this way, and then we're like, oh, shit, he's right. You know? yeah. That's why he tops 1,000 players' turn. 1,000 players' turn. <laughs> exactly, <with>. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. Next one's from Alan Cobb, said, Great content as always, lads. As a Ruby Amethyst, as Ruby Amethyst OG slash connoisseurs, I consider you guys go the go to resource for the most up to date Ruby Amethyst deck. Have you updated the list since the deck tech video based on shifts in the meta? I must admit, I was one of the listeners who got a bit fed up last one right when you kept banging on about the Ruby Amethyst <laughs> deck, but now I'm well on board with in, uh, well aboard the train with Rise of the Floodborne. I'm now a little disappointed when you don't talk about it as much. <laughs> How about a dedicated five minute section of the show where you just indulge us Ruby Amethyst players and everyone else can skip ahead. Merry Christmas and happy new years to you three. Thanks for all you've done for the community and here's to a great 2024. All right. So up to the, the real question, which is, have you made any updates to the Ruby Amethyst deck since the video? I know. So Moyen, this was mainly your list and it was a bit atypical. It was a bit different than other people's lists. You know, it really wasn't playing the top end. You know, would you, con- have you made updates or would you consider making updates? Um. So... I think the biggest thing is that I've increased the uh, quantity of one jobs to increase consistency of, of the meta mims. And I've also put in more thought into or in consideration to uh, how often is Pascal actually better than another 1-3 and how often can a 1-3 be better because if there's more aggro, it gives you the better trait and is a little bit less susceptible to, to, to bot wipes. So I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm more on board with playing like 10-ish one drops instead of just eight. I think that's that's the the only big change that I've made mm-hmm. uh, since the deck tech. Oh, and I don't think I've asked you this question. Maybe I did, but let's say there was a huge tournament next weekend. Um, mm-hmm. What what deck would you bring? It would be the Ruby Amethyst for sure. So to to touch upon the other points in the question is. I don't think I want to have an extra section just for a specific deck because I want this podcast to be about what's currently best in the meta, to, to be on top of the current competitive meta. And if that's Ruby Amethyst, so be it. But it's like, if it's anything else, then we'll talk about that. I like it's, I don't have, I don't think I have that much of a bias towards the deck. It's just because it happened to be the best deck in set one or one of the two best decks in set one. And it's, currently being looked at as the best deck in the current format as well. I think I would I think if anybody on this panel is guilty of having a Bryce towards Ruby Amethyst, it's probably me. <laughs> I'll take that too. Yes. That's fine. Yes. Sir. Uh, all right. So next one here is from Chucky Davis. They say, enjoy listening to the podcast each week. The insights and discussion that come from each episode have helped me on my grind to Grandmaster. Locations seem to be another layer of gameplay that could widely reshape the meta once playable. I think it's still too early to tell, but if we get locations with additional effects or other cards which synchronize with locations, they'll benefit mid range or control our archetypes the most as added benefits will most resemble planeswalkers from magic the gathering and i can explain what that is if you guys don't know big tempo loss for aggro uh but will take over the game if unchecked for my question are there any cards or mechanics from the first two sets that are slash were underutilized that could make a comeback when set three drops uh, in my opinion support as a mechanic may need a second look as uh as in a vacuum it could allow aggressive strats to nullify the tempo loss when dealing with locations while uh still removing them efficiently would love to know if each of you have a sleeping giant that you're ready to break out in set three. 
That's an interesting, interesting question. Mechanics. Yeah, I like the idea of yeah. yeah. I like the idea of bringing out support, especially if you have these big chunky locations, right? Like, I don't think support is a bad effect at all. I just think in, especially in this meta where it seems to be very focused on either uh, controlling the board with like stuff like be prepared and like your big cards, tremains and stuff like that, or the alternative, which is your clearing them with uh, AOE effects, like grab your swords and having all of the little removal tools that Amber Steel has. Um. I think right now, support doesn't really matter. Like, if you tried to make an Alice deck work right now, I don't think you're going to successfully do that. Um, but in set three, it might actually work because if you're trying to get rid of all of these locations, I also agree with Chucky that, like, we, we've we seen one location, so, like, a lot can still come, uh, and I think there will be a lot of cool synergies that we'll see. But uh, besides um, support, I don't know if there's anything that I particularly... I have one. I okay, think, it, okay. I think it might be bad shoot. though. Um, my sleeping but then giant. Shoot, why not? My sleeping giant for set three. Um, and I know say, why it's not currently. Don't say goofy. It's not. Don't say goofy. It's, it's not evasive <laughs> either. It's <a> <laughs> <laughs> not evasive. Is actually a uh, steel sapphire ramp, like the old ramp deck. I remember I played it uh, for a gameplay video once, and it just felt pretty broken. Like ramp itself is really powerful right now. Don't get me wrong, but ramp with a whole new world feels like it. It's just missing a few pieces to be a very, very good deck. Because, like, when I was playing that deck and I was legitimately drawing my entire deck, had 14 ink, it was like, I, this, this, is, I'm definitely abusing something in the game. Unfortunately, I just don't have the payoffs in terms of like the actual cards I can be casting. But that strategy, or at least that archetype, felt like if, you know, Sapphire or Steel got enough tools that could actually control the board or punish the opponent, um, it could be really, really good. That's a good I think that's, that's an interesting point, because basically the deck's capable of getting card advantage and ink advantage, and then still losing the game. <laughs> I know, so, <laughs> impressive. It's an impressive feat. <laughs> yeah, so if it, if it gets the, the missing tools, I, I see some potential in that color combination. What about you, Moen? Any Any Sleeping Giants? Ah, uh, there's no sleeping giants. Any mechanics um, or or like keywords that you were interested in but didn't end up playing out due to like meta conditions? Um, so right now we have a lot of like pretty efficient discard tools that don't have a place in current meta. Oh, thank God. I think, <laughs> yeah, which I'm I'm not <laughs> sad about, but I think um they they don't need much more to become viable in the future either. Yeah, yeah. I mean that was my that was my biggest. Uh, <laughs> My biggest worry for set two, and I was very happy it didn't play out. But I mean, those cards, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, they're not going anywhere. So yeah, I hope something doesn't tilt that over the edge to where that becomes super playable. So so what about the Planeswalkers, Brandon? So Planeswalkers <clears throat> um, are a card that comes onto the battlefield that is not generally able to be interacted with most cards in Magic. Um it usually needs to be interacted with a card that specifies Planeswalker, which limits your card pool, or it needs to be interacted with Combat. Combat is harder because your opponent can also block. So basically, they're very, very durable threats. And mm -hmm. they take, they take every single turn, they have three abilities. So they're a card that you play down, and now that, that card in and of itself has usually three to four abilities, and you have this loyalty counter, so you have this counter on it, and you can take it up, uh, with one of the abilities, take it down with one of the abilities, and usually the last ability is like, you can take it down for like eight or something, and you get an ultimate ability, which is usually win the game. But it would start at like five, it would start at like five, and you have to tick it up three times. Um, so your opponent has plenty of time to try to get rid of it, but they're just, they're basically threats you play to the board that are permanent. And they're very hard for the opponent to deal with. And they have this incremental advantage every single turn. Um, and yeah, they're, it, it, yeah, it's a weird way to it changed the dynamic of magic for sure, to say the least. They were they were they were fun to play around. I mean, I had my first time using them during the MTG Twitch Rivals event, and uh, I thought it was really cool because it's like it's like that kind of incremental advantage, like oh, you can use this effect, and if you increase it for enough turns, then you kind of get the payoff of using that huge. Okay, just so you could use eight loyalty points to I don't know. Let's say for example, use eight loyalty points to just wipe the opponent's board and deal damage to them or something like that, right? Like it's like yeah. super interesting. Well, usually getting yeah. it, well the problem with the <laughs> the ultimate is usually you get an emblem with it. So now when you do the ultimate ability, you usually get another permanent, but now this permanent literally cannot be removed. Like emblems cannot mm. be interacted with. So you have an emblem that says 
every single turn your opponent sacrifices two permanents. So that like includes their lands and shit. It's like yeah, it's crazy. basically, you know, kind of win the game. Not all of them are like that. Uh, but yeah, it's it's interesting. It's magic has created a lot of cards that they're they are cards, but they include like a sub game after you play or like in the card in and of itself. So I think planeswalkers are an expression of that. Also like this like enter the dungeon stuff, which oh my god, that was like a whole nother thing. Um but you like ha you you're playing the game of magic and then once you play the planeswalker, you play this now this this additional sub game of magic, um almost to say. But yeah, they're very hard to interact with. That is that is one key thing about them. And they're in general quite powerful. Um I think it's a fair comparison. It's just I don't know if uh locations are that hard to interact with. I think I think I think we'll have some interaction. I think we'll get. We, I think we will get some interaction cards with locations yeah. from from the opposing player. If you could um, block in Lorcana, like you can block a Magic the Gathering, then I think they would be closer in power level. But they are similar in the sense that they are not able to be interacted with in a normal manner that most cards are in this game. We haven't seen any like target location at, removal. And, yeah, at, at the current moment in yeah. time. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> Solace um, Colosseum, the entire Nexus. <laughs> no, okay. But uh, yeah, no, I I do. I do agree with Chuck. I, I personally would kind of like to see a. We talked about it last week. I'd love to see a very combat focused um, meta of Lorcana where it, like you know effects like support and stuff like that are super impactful. Mainly because like I, I remember this from like the first time I played against Brendan when we used like webcams and stuff with the starter, the decks. starter decks. Like yeah. we we who, quickly who top like, decks like, Dr. Fassier first. Yeah, who who top decks the Well like what was really interesting was like Lorcana is very much like when you when you get to when you're in a match state where questing or not questing or attacking or not attacking is so impactful. That's when I actually really love playing it, right? Because you're each and every decision you make per character, if you have five characters on the board, your opponent has six characters on the board um, they're just not questing, they're going for like an alpha quest or something like that. That's super interesting because it gets really mathy and really kind of uh, complex and I haven't had that in Lorcana in quite some time and I really enjoyed when it was like that. So I I really want to have a, a combat-based meta again. I may regret that. We may come <laughs> back to this in three months' time and me go like, oh, I don't want this shit, but I don't know. I, do, I, I would like to try it out now, yeah, for sure. Next one is from Roar Bear. They say, for the conversation on going first versus second, Pixelborn stats, and if you didn't know, Pixelborn posts its stats, uh, a myriad of stats every single week. Um, there's people in that Discord that are probably also on Twitter that aggregate those stats and do a little bit of data visualization for it. I know Gigabyte is one of the people that comes to mind for that. Um, in regards to going first versus second, Pixelborn stats show the first player has a 59 to 60% win rate. I think that's a troubling statistic. Question for the group. Can you think of anything that might narrow the gap between play versus draw? So I think we talked about it last week. Uh, not not to answer the entire question, but I think we talked about one concept that would sort of um, presuppose our answer, which is I do think that Ravensburger wants there to be a gap in play draw. I do think that this they do want a advantage uh, and they're okay with a significant advantage going first versus second. And I don't think that they've tried to equalize that whatsoever in design. So it makes me wonder if that is just part of design. It's an inherent variance in design is that going first is much better, but I'll pass this over to you guys. The question of, can you think of anything that might narrow the gap between play draw and Moy and the Hearthstone players think the coin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, I, I'm not very creative. So uh, how about we give the second player going second a cut that gives you one resource. <laughs> one ink for one turn. They just ink the top of their deck on turn zero. So when their opponent has their turn one, they just ink the top of their deck as well. But what if the top of your deck is so important, Brendan, that no, I no, want to no, know no, what no, that no, card no. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That would be such a downside to going second. <laughs> I, th I think it's it's not an easy uh, thing to, to, to balance the going first versus going second thing. It's just, I wish there was some additional thing to just second player... Uh, drawing a cut. Yeah, it's pretty much all downside, right? Like in Magic, it's rare, but there are cases where you would want to go second. Um, Flesh and Blood is very dynamic, whether you want to go first or second. But in Lorcana, I think it is just overwhelmingly correct to always go first. And I can't even see in, that even changing. In, even in Hearthstone, you would usually want to go second, but some decks would just have so much synergy with the coin itself, mm. with like playing a free card. 
on 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 a, one of their turns that some decks would want to go second. Yeah, so I have but, a question off of that. So if the coin didn't exist, if the mm-hmm. player going said didn't have the coin, y- throughout all of Hearthstone's history and meta, yeah. it would always be correct to go first with every deck, right? If the coin didn't exist. Yeah. Okay, I think that that's that's closer to Lokana. Mm, yeah, I agree. It's Hearthstone without a coin, kind of, yeah. You do get the additional card, which matters, because I guess your cards would be split. I don't know. I don't know. I can't I can't see it changing that you would ever go on to go second in Orkana. I always troll my I troll my opponents frequently when they win the die roll. It's like, oh, you want to go second, right? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, what? I'm like, dude, no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Relax. <laughs> All right. Next one is from... Oh, do we think they can narrow anything? Uh, mechanics, like, I just want to answer this question. So in terms of mechanics, the, the thing that I would think of, which is not creative, but the key to having a mechanic that limits this is also, it needs to be super intuitive. Can't re- I don't think it should require any other additional game pieces. So for me, I would make it so that the person going second, I think, just places the top card of their deck in their ink. So the players maintain ink parity. But then they hit, Wait, they hit, then, then they're ahead, right? So, but they go down. I mean, I mean yeah, yeah. Then they just the gap's just a different it's way. It's just different but way. But then you always want to go second. No, yeah, but then I, we always want to go I second. That's the <laughs> thought of something. Okay, okay, okay. So, because I think there's an inherent advantage in going first, and the way to balance this is to give a different inherent advantage to player going second. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, what if player second would start with X amount of lore in play? So they wouldn't need twenty to get to twenty, but like. 18 or whatever just some amount of oh, lore like give them I mean, one one extra lore That's yeah kind of they start with some some lore at the start of the game it's not like i don't know i, I don't think it's the cleanest way to fix it but mm. i think it's uh the easiest way to actually narrow the gap yeah i that's interesting i would say i don't think it's clean but i do think it would add a lot of push and pull because say you're playing a control deck and you're playing against an aggro deck you're like mm-hmm. Well, I really don't want my opposing aggro deck to maybe start second, so I'll go second because I want them to. I don't want them to get two free lore or something like that. So you'd actually be making decisions. Um, that being said, all in mm-hmm. all, I do think that the play draw discrepancy is part of the game design. Unfortunately, right now, I do think that sure. they like that. Um, yeah, could be true. All right, next one is from Alfred O'Saint. They say mechanically, locations are characters with downsides. A powerful location will be will be so because of its huge stats for low cost. Abilities are powerful cards that have synergy with locations. Uh, sorry, I kind of read that weird, but all all things uh, that can also be all of these things can also be characters. Where I see the the potential novelty in locations is in buffing characters. I do think that this is probably what going to come though, right? Because we see a vanilla location in the form of Forbidden Castle or whatever. Surely there will be locations that are, you know, when you move a character there, it's giving the character something, right? That's like the yeah. Yeah, they, or characters at this location gain extra lore, or characters at this location have extra uh, strength or mm. whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, Will yeah. They'll be like, they'll be like a, I don't know, like. Rapunzel's Tower or something and be like princesses get plus one lore here or, or plus it's kind of like uh, it kind of it kind of comes back to that card um, what's it called Grand Grand Duke I think that card's gonna see play in in some deck pretty soon like when I say pretty soon like pro- maybe set three that's the one that buffs like all of the regal characters right it's like queens yeah. kings mm. princesses I've already faced it a couple of times yeah like it's it's not a bad card by any means so uh, yeah, I think that's 100% coming. We'll see locations interact with specific character tribes, but as the game continues to grow and more sets come out, we're going to see more synergies with like uh, tribes already, for sure. Mm-hmm. All right. Last one here is from uh, Camille Boomer. They say, a bit of a controversial question. Do you think Pixabor saved Lorcana's beginnings? So this is an interesting question. So um, if anybody did, wasn't here for chapter one, which I know was pretty recent, so probably most people, uh, it was heavily scalped. It was very hard to get, particularly in the United States, even worse in like some other areas of the world, like uh, Asia um, or just APAC in general. Um, I know maybe South America as well. Europe, it was probably the easiest to get. And yeah, did it save its beginnings? I don't... For me, I don't know if it saved his beginnings. Before I pass this question over to you, I do want to say that I think that Pixelborn is the best thing that happened to Lorcana for Ravensburger. It's the best thing that happened to Lorcana for us as well, because we have to play the game a lot and we can play it on demand. We can test out the X4E buy, et cetera, et cetera. But the number one thing 
that is conducive to a game success, in my opinion, because we have this question, we have this come up in, in Flesh and Blood as well, which has a digital analog, which is not sanctioned by the publisher. The number one thing that's conducive to a game success is people playing that game. And these online clients, they facilitate more people playing that game. So many people play Lorcana week by week. You can see on the Pixel Point stats, it's incredible. Um, and I'm sure that converts people into playing into paper uh, more often than not. And I think that this, when you have buy-in prices of $300, $500 plus, it's very important to give players a way uh, to test out decks before they purchase something. Like you don't, you don't want to come into a game, spend $700 on a deck, and then a new set comes out and that gets negated, or you just pick the wrong deck because you followed some clickbait YouTube video or something like that. So I think Lorcana is the best thing that happened to the game. Did it save its beginnings? Uh, I don't know Pixel if it's... Born. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, sorry. I don't know if it saved yeah. its beginnings, but it definitely helped it a lot. Like, I think a lot. I know, I think actually all of us, me, Moyen, Kawa, maybe not Kawa, would have not played the game if it wasn't for Pixelborn <laughs> in the beginning. Yeah. For, for me, it definitely saved the game. Um, because I wouldn't have even given it a chance if I couldn't just do it uh, very easily from home without buying cuts. Um, so basically, it gives you a... Even if you have cards and you like playing in person, it still gives you a different way to play the game and to spend time on the game that you like, which wouldn't always be possible in person. And then also, I think you raise a very good point in uh, being able to test what you... Like, what decks are good, what how decks compare against each other, but also what even just what decks you enjoy, so you can make... Uh, uh, a good decision on on what cards you want to be purchasing, and so so that you're not left with, um, how do you say it? So so that you're not left regretting your 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 decision of buying mm -hmm. cards, because I think that's the easiest way to stop playing a game if you like buy a deck and then you realize it's, it's bad or you realize yeah. you don't enjoy it, but you still bought it and just feel so bad about it that I think that could actually force like not force but that could make people quick and it's less of a problem because we have an online simulator yeah i agree i think uh the best thing for me honestly it's it's uh we'll probably lead into it a little bit and it's going to be interesting because i really want to ask brendan about this because we're going to be talking about how to prepare for events in today's episode and uh a tool like pixelborn will help tremendously with this in my opinion because I mean, realistically, if there was a huge event coming up in in Europe, and even if Brendan wasn't gonna fly over to play, you know, I, I could still prep it and because of Pixelboard. Obviously, you could still prep and discuss different things without a tool like this, but it helps so much. It means I can actually play against my friends all around the world, right? Yeah. Like, uh, I actually recently saw, uh, I think, yeah, I think the guy who made Pixelborn, he posted about how big the uh, Discord's gotten, and if I'm remembering correctly, I'm pretty sure it, the Pixelborn Discord has more people in it than like MTG Arena. It's getting close on some other like TCG, like official TCG digital clients, which is like, it's beyond impressive, honestly. Like I think um, Saved Lorcana's Beginnings is a big statement. I think it helped it grow tremendously in a situation where the game was incredibly hard to acquire a lot of people wanted to play the game were interested in playing the game and because of this resource they were able to like uh in my situation like it's a really rare situation for me how i kind of got into lorcana and my, my inside as well it was like i i mean the only reason i had so many cards when so many people didn't was because i was in germany around the time of launch and mm. i was at a booth that just had booster packs like anyone else in the world could not go to their i mean brendan talked about it he went to his local game store like yeah 400 bucks buddy for a booster box you know it's like it's absolutely crazy so for me personally i was just very fortunate to be in a situation where i could acquire the cards and it was really special for me because it was my first physical tcg and i, I really enjoyed that kind of dynamic versus a, a digital card game so i've played so many digital card games but as a tool and as a resource yes i think pixel born is incredibly important. It really helped uh, Lorcana's growth initially. It's still helping its growth. And I have to agree with Brendan's point that Ravensburger, I'm sure Ravensburger realized how impactful it has been 
to the game's success. Yeah, for sure. And I'm sure Ravensburger has lawyers in Disney. So if they, I think that they've had a discussion about it and they were like, this is actually good for our game. Cause uh, mm-hmm. like when you think about a small, like an actual small publisher, like flesh and bloods publisher, like legend story studios, you can be like, Oh, the digital thing is still up because they don't have lawyers. You know, they're just like a small company and they're just letting it fly. Like in my opinion, which is an uneducated opinion, pocket out of my butt, but I would assume that Ravensburger knows about Pixelborn and has decided that this is going to be, this is good for the game. And there is Moyens. You went to Germany. Like, well, you're pretty close. Promo, yeah. promo goofy. That was just the Gamescom promo goofies because it was the event that Carl was talking about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've got six of those. I think those are. I think set one cards like the. Yo, bro, I milked it. I gave one to Specy because you won the uh, the Cusco Cup. But yeah, I think cards like that will will definitely uh, increase in value. But yeah, overall, come back to the question. Yeah, I think Pixelborn is great, and I think Ravensburger. No, it's a a a good thing for the game. But at the same time. They they could shut it down if they wanted to. There's no doubt in my mind that if tomorrow they they wanted the guy to shut it down, yeah. and I know that in an interview he said if they asked if they him asked to shut him, it yeah, down, he down. would he would he would he would shut it down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. So I mean, they're yeah. They I don't even think they'd even have the S and D, and they would just ask. And it's been the same. Mm-hmm. It's been the same case it. in Flesh and Blood, by the way. Just so you, just so everybody knows, I don't talk too much about Flesh and Blood in this podcast. But Flesh and Blood had a, has a digital analog um, in the form of Talishar. Uh, it also had draft simulations, um, so you could simulate drafting. All of the draft sites got taken down. The other one got left up. So the draft one, theoretically, the idea behind it is it actually stops people from going into stores, opening up packs, because you actually have to have people to do it. Um, it's not something you can be very easily simulated, it's something like tabletop simulator um, or like webcam. So they took all of those down, but they left up the Pixelborn equivalent. So I wouldn't be surprised to see something happen in this in this game. Anyway, if you want to get your question or statement read out on next week's podcast, you can shoot us a comment on YouTube and we'll get it queued up. All right, main topic. We made it, boys. Main topic, how to prepare for events. <clears throat> All right, so the first thing I want to talk about is expected metagame. I think metagaming and being prepared for the correct metagame is one of the most important things when it comes to being successful at a tournament. Um, probably equally as important as play. So there's usually three... <clears throat> sort of uh, a triangle in a metagame, rock, paper, scissors, I like to say, but it's not always the case, but you want to look at it as the best deck, the deck that beats the deck, <clears throat> and then sometimes the deck that beats the deck that beats the deck. Um, what deck you end up on is a bit, you know, is sort of up to your play style. Uh, I think for the early tournaments, we like to call it as going layer one. So going layer one, be just just play the best deck. Um, don't go too deep because you, when you start metagaming, you start going down these thought patterns of um, are people going to play the best deck? Are they going to play the deck that beats the deck that, you know, if I play the best deck, is everyone going to be targeting me? For the early tournaments, at least with my experience in card games so far, the early tournaments are always dominated by layer one metas. They're dominated by people playing the most obvious best deck and you should prepare for a tournament in that. So that means playing the best deck and being prepared for the mirror or playing a deck that beats that deck um, and sort of exploiting the meta representation with that uh, so, so-called so best deck. All right, and for our last section, it's kind of just this tertiary type of decks or this tertiary area of decks, which is the deck that beats the deck that beats the deck, or it's trying to break the meta, bring an unknown deck um, and just sort of flip it on its head. That's, that's, where I, that's my favorite place to be. I think it is more often than not, the incorrect place to be. I think that you will more often than not end up with a deck that is not as good as you think it is. Um, and you probably are trying a little bit too hard to play outside of the box. But ultimately, uh, that is where I like to end up. And we'll get into more detail about like how long should you spend in the testing process of like, you know, trying to break the deck, trying to break the game with these new decks, trying to build combo decks. Because I've been to many a pro tour and world championships where we spend way too long <laughs> on some terrible combo deck and we get there, you know, two, three days before and we have to be like, oh my God, now we have to go learn the real decks and play those because this was unsuccessful. Uh, Moe, I just want to pass over to you for how you approach metagaming and picking um, a deck for a tournament. For For what? How you approach metagaming and picking a deck for a tournament. Um, yeah, so, so I think you're right that most of the time it's just best deck or deck that beats the best deck. I don't really like to go third level because not enough people tend to go... In, in big uh, in big events, no, I think not enough people tend to go level 2 to make level 3 viable. Mm-hmm. So it's like either either level 1 or level 2 is usually what I, what I go for. Um... 
And then breaking the meta is, is cool and all, but... So basically, I think people love to break the meta so much that they even go minus EV just so that if they win, they, at least they were the one that broke the meta. Mm -hmm. So it's not always the, the best thing to do, but I can see the temptation in, in it for sure. Yeah, I, I felt that temptation many a time, <laughs> many a time in my day. Uh, Carl, I know you don't you don't have as much experience in paper tournaments, but just drawing on your experience from Marvel Snap and other games that you've played, <clears throat> do you find yourself being more a player that's playing sort of the layer one, like the best deck? What would be in this format through the Amethyst or trying to target that best deck and get an edge on players that are bringing the most popular deck at the tournament? It's quite interesting. Whenever I'm trying to do stuff solo, uh, not testing with teams, uh, to put to give you guys some perspective, like whenever there is like not, I wouldn't say high stake tournaments, but whenever there's like if there's like a weekly tournament, it's like 100, 150 bucks to win it. I'd bring, I'd be the person who's bringing like a quake deck or some weird shit like that. You know what I mean? Trying to trying to have fun with because the stakes aren't too high. That being said, I had one of the best testing experience to date when I tested with Moyen and Lowell for the Switzerland tournament, which was honestly so much fun. The funniest thing about it was it was such a limited time that we had. I could really tell that Moyen, every time like we were like trying to make a decision, he was like, shit, I wish we had more time to test. Um, <laughs> but it was it was a lot of fun. Um, and even just li like, I, I learned so much from, from Moyen during uh, testing for that event. And it was just fun to experiment with different things, try different techs, discuss strategy with uh, other players with similar mindsets and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. uh, what was funny about that particular event was I I was really confident going in with a certain type of deck. And then Moyen and Lowell were mm -hmm. like, oh, we're going to like put in this tech to beat this specific thing. I ended up just like, it was like five minutes before submission. I was like, I hate you guys. And I just put in the same decks as them because if they played the decks that they chose, they would have absolutely annihilated me. So, uh, yeah, it, it was really fun. It's really, really fun testing with uh, with a group and stuff like that. And I do agree, though, overall, that I wish we had a little bit more time because, I mean, with more time, you find out more things. And like you were saying, Brendan, I feel like with more time, if you spend a day or two, you'll quickly realize, oh, this is not the right idea. We should focus on, on something else, right? Yeah, I think that the testing so, process... So basically for... Go ahead. You're good. For that event, it was like a two-deck... Uh, format. It's the best kind where, of snap format right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but you only had to play one of them. So it was kind of random and a weird format, but still, we uh, finally came to the conclusion that one of those, those decks uh, was going to be in a lot of lineups, no matter how they tried to approach it, and ended up uh, taking our one deck so well for it that we could never lose to it, which basically made them unable to play that deck. Because they were so scared of queuing. We into this, forced this one them to card. play. Was, like, yeah, it was so yeah. good. It was so good. So we like forced them to play the other deck, and then we had two decks that covered each other's weaknesses very well. So we could have a very good matchup into whatever deck they queued. So we we came out with like a huge edge in that in that tournament, and it was the best thing was that the tech card we put in was, was super scroll for people actually playing Marvel Snap, and it was a terrible card at the time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't seen in any anyone's decks, but then out of nowhere, it was incredibly good in this tournament yep um when we went to the uk all three of us were in the uk as two deck format as well marvel snap two deck format and i know there's probably a lot of people listening to this that are paper card game players haven't played marvel snap but marvel snap two deck format is one of the funnest formats i've played for same thing you basically had you played one deck that was really really good and your other deck was a proxy deck to force your, de your opponent off of playing decks that counter your deck um for instance i had a similar deck uh, similar concept to you guys where i had a a very, very bad deck. A very, very bad deck that absolutely destroyed the decks that countered the main deck I wanted to play. And I was playing a little card called Shadow King, which is a very good card now in Marvel Snap that's been reworked and, you know, the values have been adjusted. Back in those days, I don't think anybody had included that in a ladder list. Like, Z, Z brought it as well. Z3PO brought it. But it was a very bad card. Um, and I played against one of the best Marvel Snap players in the world, Lambie series. And... Uh, yeah, he didn't respect my my proxy deck, so he queued his deck into my deck, and I 10 owed him. It was like absolutely, yeah, yeah. I remember that. I remember seeing that because we didn't cast that game. I remember seeing that on the side. It was like, what just happened? Yeah, and oh, my favorite man. part of that game was that I was playing on a phone. Everybody else was playing on computers because the computers were a bit funky. Um, 
and I disconnected in the last game and we were playing for six cubes, which is a huge amount. This is in conquest. And I disconnected the last turn of the game and I couldn't, I couldn't really lock in my choice. Like I, I thought I locked him. I just didn't know. Couldn't get back into the game. And I know, I knew I won the game when Lambie sitting a couple of seats down from me goes, are you kidding me? And I was just like, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, anyway. All right. So you mentioned a few things there. Um, main one I want to pick out is you talked about sort of this uh, this this congregation of ideas when you when you form a testing team, and I think it's really important. Um, I do think that testing is ninety plus percent of the work when it comes to actually being successful in an event. And what's really conducive to that, what's conducive to good testing, is surrounding yourself with good players that you can test these ideas into. Um, I think one of the biggest traps is actually solo testing on something like a Pixelborn or in Flesh and Blood's example, like a Talisharp. Because that data, while it's relevant, it is not exactly representative of what you're going to face on the day when you're going into something like a day two or a top eight and you're playing against players that are very prepared and have game plans, they're ready for you and they know how their deck works. Um, And testing teams are just like, you need people that actively challenge ideas that you hold a lot of belief in that you think are very, very true. Like there, there's a lot of times when, you know, say it was even this this meta, I would think Ruby Amethyst is the best deck. Like I've just I've won with it a lot. It's doing so well in Pixelborn. It does well in all these past tournaments. But then maybe Moyen is able to whip out some aggro deck that you know tweaks a few things. So it's maybe it's a bad deck overall, but it just absolutely stomps my deck. It's it's important to sort of challenge those ideals and reevaluate. Um, and the testing teams are really conducive for that. So I think surrounding yourself with with a good group of players with talent. Ta- it's actually it's less about talented players and more about players that are willing to learn and challenge ideas and not have like ego attached to ideas. Um, is super super important. Um, in regards to testing, the way I like to approach it in general is. <laughs> It's in a very unfun way. I like to be very disciplined and structured about it um, and maintain a lot of data. So we usually create like pretty robust Excel sheets, uh, Google Sheets, where we track the data and actually visualize the data of all of our matchups, make sure we cover the entire metagame and try to get more of an objective sort of truth out of what our internal testing metagame looks like. So, you know, everybody might be walking away after, you know, after a day of testing, like, yeah, Ruby Amethyst is the best deck, Ruby Amethyst is the best deck. But then you look at the data over 100, 200 games, and it's got like a 51% win rate. And you're like, oh, well, that maybe that's not exactly exactly what we believe. We need to go back and sort of reevaluate, um, reevaluate that. So I like to maintain de- data. I like to be really structured about it. I, I like to I like to test daily. Um, if possible, with like X time leading up to event. And then finally, what's super, super important to me, like if we're talking about a a high level tournament, so something like a world championship, I like to get out to the location, whether it's across the world, you got to adjust for jet lag, get out to the location with the testing team, get a testing house and crank those in-person paper reps. It's super important. If I don't know if any of you guys have ever been through this, but if you've ever played a game digitally, that's uh, also played in paper. So like like uh, Disney Lorcana, and you hadn't played in paper for a while, it will feel weird. And you like the it the muscle memory is just not there. And I think you got to get those those in person reps. For sure, yeah. Um, that's one thing I even experienced a little, little bit in one of my first uh, smaller events. But uh, even testing in paper with with Raven was super super fun and it, it really really helped because at that stage i was testing mainly on pixelborn i wasn't playing too much in person and um it's just thing that i think it really helped us it really really helped us because we knew kind of our own matchup uh how that was going to play out but then because raven was on i think it was on emerald steel at the time it was kind of similar to uh amber steel as well so it kind of uh had an idea of how it was going to play into into some other deck types as well but yeah I mean, overall for me right now, I really enjoy playing in paper. So it might eat, nearly be weird for me to try and start testing in Pixelborn, which is kind of funny. Yeah. But um, Pixelborn is fast, yeah. is fast, it's efficient, and it's uh, it's very convenient, right? So like, if you're playing in paper and you're like, I'm trying to test five different decks in the metagame, like you have oh, to have them all yeah, sleeved up. Mm, you got to be switching mm. out cards. Like you're like, oh, I want to test these three cards, and I got to go dig through my bin and find it. Like Pixelborn is really f- effective for testing like the initial sort of evaluation of a metagame and building new decks and doing things like that. Um, but I like to get the last few reps in paper. One concept I want to talk about is gauntlet decks. So gauntlet decks is a concept that exists in pretty much all card games. Basically what it means is like you want to get like this like average deck 
for each deck in the metagame. You know, build build an average-ish deck of each deck in the metagame to test and do. Because it's one of the most unhealthy things I think that can happen in testing is that you're trying to test, uh, you know, you guys all want to play Ruby Sapphire. And you're testing into the games. You put your friends on. You're like, okay, can you give me some games? You play Ruby Amethyst or you play Amber Steel. And, you know, maybe they start swapping out cards to tech against you. And they end up with like a Ruby Amethyst deck that is like very teched for your Ruby Sapphire deck, which is not appropriate. And they, it's just in testing, it can happen where you the, the group degenerates and both players are trying to win rather than achieve an objective result and get data. So gauntlet decks are... Like if you looked at a metagame, you would try to build an average is deck for each pillar of the metagame. So right now it'd be like Ruby Amethyst, Amber Steel, some sort of aggro deck, and then Ruby Sapphire. And then you want to test into those with the deck that you plan on bringing. That makes sense, yeah. Yep. yeah. That's a really cool idea. Mm -hmm. I, don't know if I, have, I have so many points adding up in my head. Um, for, the, for the matchup spreadsheet, it, it used to be... I mean, we did the same, but it was so much more work, I think, mm -hmm. in Hearthstone because we had like four deck formats, best of fives with, with a ban, and then you had to work out different ban strategies, work out what against what strategies you'd have, like what estimated win percentage um, of your decks and, and in total. But I think um, it is it, it is not that much work if you're just playing one deck for the entire tournament. I think that's everyone should be able to do that. And then one thing that I want to talk about is pe I, people like to get caught up on this one thing especially if they have a high ego and mm -hmm. i i do have a high ego as well so I'm, I'm i'm speaking out of experience but uh basically it is very easy to fall into the trap of oh if i prep with someone and they're participating in the tournament that i'm participating in am i not like weakening my chances by increasing theirs but let's say there's like a thousand player tournament and, and even if you have like a 10 player uh, prep group even if these 10 players are very well prepared you help you uh, helping yourself is so much more important than also um than not helping a few others that are participating in the same tournament and uh you cannot neglect how important it is to exchange ideas mm -hmm. with others that also challenge your ideas and don't just uh to help you not fall into your own ignorance and ego yeah um, it's invaluable. Happened in Flesh and Blood quite a point. bit. Yeah. So Flesh and Blood, the early days were dominated. The early tournaments were dominated by very, very small private testing groups, ultra private, ultra secretive, um, and it didn't. It it paid off sometimes. Like some that did seem to be a somewhat optimal strategy. Fast forward one two years, the general player player skill level, the general player base is this much better at the game. There's so much information online for content creation, um, etc. Pretty much all testing groups in Flesh and Blood, which has a million and a half prize pool each year, are relatively open. They co they sort of co-mingle, they share ideas, like the testing houses are pretty open. Like when you're when you're in at the actual location, like we're in Barcelona, you're going to different testing houses. Like people are really, really open with like what they're playing because they know that everybody is so good at the game right now that they don't, there is, there really is no secret and you're better off telling, like being like, oh, this is the deck I'm actually planning to play. And people be like, mm, nah, I don't think so because of this, this, and this. And we've tested this, you know, 50 or so times and it didn't work for us. What strategy do you have that we didn't have that actually made this good? And you're like, well, I didn't have a different strategy. It's like, oh, well, you're actually going to lose when you play against good people. And like, it just feels like the open ish testing i mean obviously there's 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 levels to it but the open ish testing and sharing as much ideas as possible and really challenging the things that you think are correct is going to lead you to a better result rather than not that's been my that's been my experience and that's coming from a game that started out with like ultra private ultra secretive testing groups um and it's just absolutely not the case three years down the line all right for sure the day of <laughs> yeah, I mean, Moyen just played a pretty long tournament, to be honest. So logistics, I think that when it comes to performing at a tournament, I like to get everything sort of anything that's not gameplay done before the tournament, uh, as much of it done as possible. So that means like sorting out like all the food I'll have, all the water I'll have. Um, like if it's a game that has sideboards and stuff, like I want to have all my sideboards written out. I don't want to think. I don't want to think outside of the gameplay. I don't want to think about anything. I don't want it to be 4 p.m. and I'm like, oh, I'm hungry. I need to go eat like a pizza from the, the stand over here and like die because I have a food coma. Like <laughs> it, I think it, there's no real like 
you have to do it this way or you have to do it that way. But I do think that it is objectively correct to minimize like all of these things that you might have to deal with or think about during the day as possible. And you can sort those out before. Obviously, getting things like good sleep is really important and making sure you have some sort of sustenance so you're not starving. Um, so you could just focus on the match. So I think that if you're going to think about like what is what is the object what is the advice here? It's like get everything out of the way, as much out of the way as possible, so you can only focus on the match. Also, for people who don't know, and a lot of people, a lot of people listening is probably don't know, paper tournaments, you're going to be interacting with paper cards. Uh, you're going to need, I don't know, tools. <laughs> so you're going to need, probably need a play mat. You should bring that. You should bring a way to track life. Probably not your phone. So you should bring a life pad or something like that. Bring a pen and paper. Get used to doing that. Do that locals. Um, you also need sleeves. You should buy new sleeves for a tournament. Don't use old sleeves. You should probably even switch out your sleeves after a certain amount of rounds. Um, it is going to happen in the early days of Lorcana. You will have people that have not played tournaments um, or have not been in that kind of community that are going to get gain disqualifications or lose matches because they have marked cards. And you might hear the word marked cards and think it, ha it is inherently nefarious. It is not. <laughs> um, if your cards are marked one way or another and you get deck checked, uh, you will be issued a serious penalty. I don't know what the penalty is in the Lorcana, but you can absolutely avoid that if you just resleeve your deck with new sleeves. Make sure they're check them after every round because they do get dinged up. And then, you know, I always swap out day one and day two. I'll swap the new sleeves. But yeah, it, it happens so much. It's ridiculous. It, yeah. Sleeves get, even after one day, sleeves just get damaged from playing. And you definitely need to have backup sleeves just in case. Uh, also, you're getting deck, deck checked and there is something wrong with it uh, that you can quickly resleeve to, to get on and with the next round. Mm hmm. Mm. Yeah, yeah I, I personally. Uh, oh, so I, I personally, I don't think I'm I'm the best at being ultra prepared and having having everything out of the way. I I just wing it. But one thing, I think sleep is incredibly important because it's super easy. A, a lot of the time, the deck submission is like the morning the tournament starts. That doesn't mean you should spend uh, late evening and late night still thinking about um, should I change this one card in my deck because. This one hour of sleep that you're wasting is like so much more important than maybe switching out this one card last second that you have, you 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 should have, and I hope you have already thought about the recent weeks and put this time into. So at some point you have to say, okay, this is what I'm going to bring. This is how I'm going to approach the these matchups and and go to sleep better, mm -hmm. appropriate time. Yeah. And ideally, you're locking in that. This is, so this is another concept I think is beyond the scope of this 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 podcast specifically. Um, but that is the concept of like, you should probably lock in your deck before the night before, before submission. Um, there's no, like a lot of players fall into the trap of like swapping out this card, that card, like last minute trying to uh, sort of like min max. But usually more often than not, in my experience, people swapping cards, they shouldn't be swapping in and make bad deck choices. And for me, the optimal thing to do is to actually lock in the deck. You know, theoretically lock in the deck like a week before. Um, and then if you do have to make last minute changes, which you always do, um, you do it then, but don't leave it to the last minute where you're like, I'm waiting to the last minute to actually have my deck list. Um, the last thing I have is just taking it match by match and dealing with nerves. Um, it's pretty easy to go on tilt uh, to lose round one. And depending on how strength of schedule works in Lorcana, it could be really bad to lose round one. Uh, you could like immediately put yourself on tournament life. And it's just important to look at a tournament, especially a long tournament, match by match, and look at the matches individually and sort of stay locked in, stay in the game. Um, it sounds easy, but it's, it's harder than it sounds as well. Also, if you, if you get nervous on coverage <clears throat> and uh, you're asked to be put on coverage and you think it's going to make you lose, you can deny being put on coverage. You can, you can deny. It's actually pretty common. Um, I've, I've casted a lot of these high level tournaments and I've talked to m plenty of players that I've, you know, do you want to be on coverage? They say no. <laughs> but, but I guess it depends. There's definitely tournaments where you assign to not being able to deny. Interesting. Uh, being yeah. on coverage. In flesh and blood, you can, you can always deny. Um, okay, okay. Yeah. You can always say also in regards to judging, I don't know how judging will work in Lorcana. Um, if you ever have a question about your game state, don't ask your opponent, ask a judge. Uh, it's not weird to ask a judge. If you don't ask a judge, you're actually making the wrong decision. Um, it's weirder to not ask a judge than it is to ask a judge. Just always use the judges uh, because you're going to get yourself in trouble if you don't. And if a judge makes a call that's wrong or that you don't understand or you don't think is correct, you can appeal. 
and you should appeal. There's a reason that appeals exist. Judges, I love them. They help the game function and they're critical, but they are not infrequently, uh, they are, I wouldn't say frequently, but it happens that they're incorrect and you can appeal and then the head judge will come and give you a, give you a better answer. So yeah, just use those appeals because I've countless situations I've had where people have had incorrect judge calls and have lost matches as a result. And then they came over later, told us about it. And it was like, you, did you appeal? And they're like, no. It's like, what? <laughs> so that's how that works. I, also, I recently had a, sorry, I, I recently had something at uh, the tournament that I top aided, which, uh, is a common common question, Lorcana? Like not a crazy interaction that not many people know, but I, like at the time I wanted to clarify because I was like I I hadn't played around with lantern too much, and it was just the whole lantern and shifting thing. Um, because I was aware of it. Like before my opponent even did it, I was like in my head saying, "Okay, can my opponent do this?" I was think it was basically like I think it was they had like four rank they could have used lantern to shift into big tank, mm -hmm. right? Like I was that was a, a thought that was in my mind, and then of course. They did it. I asked, and of course, there's a few pe like a few people say, "Well, that's how we've been doing it here," and then some people haven't been doing it here. And I'm like, "Yeah, well, just like I'll ask the judge, and if the judge says yeah, like I think it's better in my mind to expect if that was a possible interaction. Obviously, ideally, you want the rule, like you want to know the rule before going into a situation like that. But for me to think, okay, if this is something that that could happen, that is actually in the game and and functions as intended." then to kind of be prepared for it so that's just an, uh, an example and i was happy to put up my hand just came over clarified for it and then game moved on so yeah just want to kind of uh agree with brandon and say like please please if you're ever unsure just put your hand up ask yeah. the question it's way better than just continuing to play if, if my opponent ever asks me a question or goes to game rules i just i just tell him to ask a judge even if i mm. like obviously if it's casual i wouldn't but even if i know the answer in like a professional tournament setting so like a pro tour of the world championships which is this is not similar to locals, by the way. So if you haven't played these, like it might sound harsh what I'm doing, but this is what anytime someone asks me a question, even if I know the answer, I just tell them to ask a judge. Because if I tell them the wrong thing, you know who's on the hook? Me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I could be wrong. <laughs> also, so for taking it match by match, I think one weakness I have that I need to get rid of is uh, I hate doing mistakes. So if if I realize I've done a mistake. I, I, it can happen that I get hung up on that mistake and then like three turns later I'm still thinking hmm was it actually the correct turn I did three turns ago should I have done something different and it's 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 a valid thought it's an important thought to improve but it's the wrong time to think that thought yeah you think about it after the game you should yeah. be thinking about it you, after. you have to move yeah. on and just uh, go on from there uh, evaluate the new game state and then try to try to win from there it's very very important also, yeah, Brendan, I've I have a very interesting question. I think we might have asked you about this already, but like like a lot of the events and stuff that I've played in when I say a top eight, like they're all they're very like semi competitive. It's like the most competitive we can get mm -hmm. at this stage, right? Where there's not it's not high stakes, it's like, oh, there's a couple of packs on the line or whatever. When uh when there's a thing of a player, like it's it's very interesting to me when same I'm playing same playing against you and you go to do something and it's like you know five seconds oh i should have oh i take that back or i i do like uh <laughs> yeah, what do you do it's just it's, yeah, a, it's, it's, a, it's super it's, it's super interesting because it sometimes yeah. if, if the player asks me or whatever and i'm like oh like it i again because i know it's a semi-competitive thing yeah if they're like oh can i change it or if it's something kind of minor like oh i i actually might not ink that like if they're about to ink something and they don't or whatever i'm kind of like oh yeah it's fine or whatever but like it gets to a stage where it's like, oh, if I played this and then I played this, like they play like fucking two or three things and they say, oh shit, I take that. I'm like, no, you don't take that back. Yeah. It's like, how do you, uh, how do you deal with it in yeah, professional yeah, yeah. setting? Mm. So yeah. when you're in this, I only apply this to like legitimate professional tournaments. Um, but you should, both players should maintain the rules. There's pl some players in this will is going to be less likely in Lorcana than it is in other games because there isn't priority. But some players will actively try to manipulate game states and manipulate you in order to put you in a position where you lose because of things that are not based on the board, they're based on the rules. And that sucks. Uh, you can refer to it as angle shooting. It happens. Um, but that... It, there are, people have wildly different takes on this. Like, is it immoral? Are those people evil? Uh, is it justified? At the end of the day, if you're in a professional tournament, the rules are the rules, and it is up to you to not let those players do that to you, and it's up to you to maintain the rules. This isn't wasn't what your question was, 
call. I just want to say that in general because it will come up, um, and there will be people that become like the like the the heels or the bad the bad pe- the bad boys of of Larkana, and they will, <laughs> those people suck. I mean, they do, but if they're playing within the rules, like. At a professional setting, the rules are the rules, and you need to understand the rules, and so does your opponent. And if both players understand the rules well, those situations never occur. In the case of people taking stuff back, um, yeah, I mean, at pretty much every possible tournament that could happen in Lorcana right now, I'd probably let it happen. Um, if we're at the World Championships, i do what I do in Flesh and Blood, which if someone asks me if they can take something back, I say, ask a judge. And you know what they don't do? They don't ask a judge because it's a ridiculous, a ridiculous, it's often a ridiculous situation where they have clearly missed something. They are far beyond it. And I was like, ask a judge. (laughs) because <laughs> they wouldn't because i'm not gonna tell them yes or no it's not up to me i'm not the arbiter of the match like i should not be gi- giving you something back or taking something away that's like this weird social credit system so the simplest answer is why don't you ask a judge and the judge comes over he's like what happened if they lie about the situation that's bad don't let them do that but you just say this is what happened this then they ask me and the judge will go do you want to let them have that back yep no <laughs> Because yeah. if you're playing for $100,000, it's just like, that's not the situation. And this is a really hot topic, I know. Um, and I've definitely been more generous with it than I should have in the past. And plenty of people have. But uh, yeah, at, if if this sounds harsh to anybody listening, and like I just try to understand this is like not how we play the game whatsoever outside of like pro tours that we spend thousands of dollars to travel to where there's hundreds of thousands of dollars on the line. Yeah, Everybody has when, years of experience. I mean, people get really touchy about the subject call. That's why I say, um, mm-hmm. yeah. And I don't know. You just, you just have to maintain the rules. Like I've had so many conversations in flesh and blood about this because people have, you know, tried to witch hunt some people for doing this on stream and being really nasty about it. But at the end of the day, it's just the rules of the rules. The better you understand the rules, the better you can insulate yourself against it. And you should just always utilize your judges if possible. If someone asks you a question, um, you don't know the answer to it, tell them to ask a judge. That's it. I think that's I think that's completely fair, and that's the best way to go about it. Because exactly what you said, like you at the end of the day, you're not the person who should be telling them yes or no. No matter what, no matter what if you if you think they should take it back, if you your thoughts are out of the you know what I mean, until a judge comes over and then they yeah. they say, What do you want to do? If they even ask you what they the judge could just yeah. say no. The judge Often could they won't, say no. But sometimes sometimes yeah. based off the rules, it will be your decision. And then you make the decision. And it's just mm-hmm. like no matter what happens, like no matter like what game it is, players are going to lose games because they make mechanical mistakes, and that's not fun. Like it's not cool. It's not cool for either side of the table, to be honest. But um, the best way both players can insulate themselves against that is just to understand the rules and to play tight and play well. And if you're at a, if you're in a high level professional setting, again, I'm not talking about locals. Um, all players should be expected to uphold the highest level of the rules. Um, and that's that's just the only way to do it. I just don't think there's another way to answer it because a lot of people try to get like they try to I don't know they just try to take the the topic in a place that I don't think it should be taken, and it's a really contentious topic. Um, yeah, I don't know. If it's wor- put it this way, right? If it's worlds, and I play a card, or I'm about to play two cards, and go, and I go, oh, like in that moment, unfortunately, that's your mistake. Either you played too fast, or you just misplayed, and that nothing you, you you can't you can't take it back you it was an accident you didn't do it like but these things happen as well right it's not like you can say oh but i kind of just i just realized it's unfortunate and it happens but like in a i, I do agree in a setting like that um there there is there's nothing you can yeah. do about it and I it does suck always, but there is always focus yeah. on yourself like you're gonna meet people um you'll play against people in Lorcana, i'm sure i'm sure a lot of you already have you'll play against people that are assholes and they'll try to win uh, in ways that are unethical. They'll be rude to you, etc. All you can do is focus on your own play, and you'll just move on from that match. And mm-hmm. it will happen. You will play against people that are nasty people, and they might not be rotten people at their core, but they might just be nasty card players. There's plenty of people that are because whether it's because they're ultra competitive, or they just take on this other persona when playing cards. They are just not pleasant to play against. All you can do is focus on your own play. Um, because like even I've lost matches to being angle shot, being sort of you know kind of gimmicked out of situations. I've lost lots of money. I've lost big tournaments because of it. Um, but I know that at the end of the day, regardless of what the situation was, it was still my fault for getting into that situation. So that's that's a, I sure, think that's the only sure. way you can go about it. I've I've had 
really nasty experience in my in my final Swiss round on the One Piece tournament. And mm-hmm. uh, but it also came down to like card game culture, and I think it's an important message that we need to send that it will come to at the end of this. Um, so basically, I was nine one down paired. Mm-hmm. I, I was I was eight one down paired going into round ten. So I I had already had the top card safe, and my opponent uh, needed to win to actually make it into top card. So they asked me if I should, uh, why, why don't I just let them win? But they were serious about it. And I've talked to a lot of players at, 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 the, at the place, at the event, and lots of them seem to think, oh, I would do this for my friend. Mm-hmm. I would let them win. But it, this is not okay. But you have to, I think, even morally, you have an obligation to try to win at all times to, to uphold competitive integrity. So by letting someone just by just letting someone win okay you secure their to- spot in the top cut but it also means someone else that would have made it is now no longer making top cut mm-hmm. and that that that's robbing them out of something that they would have earned if you just played normally and you you have this responsibility to play normally so that that was not okay at all and then also they were they kind of pissed at me as if i was in the wrong for not letting them win yeah, uh, I mean, during during the play, card players entitled to wins. Yeah, the flesh and I don't want to interrupt, but the flesh and blood world championship, which was for three hundred thousand um, dollars, one of the players was going to make top eight, and in flesh and blood, you're not allowed to bribe in order to incentivize an opponent to concede. They did this at the feature match table because one player could make top eight if they won. The other player could have, if they had won, would not have made top eight. They discussed it. They discussed the prize put, which in that case was bribing, uh, and they were both disqualified. And that person missed yeah. out on top eight. The person who got they, the person who got in, by the way, won the tournament. So the person who was going what? to get ninth, going to mm-hmm. get ninth, got in because of the DQ, won Deserved. the entire tournament. <laughs> but it shouldn't just be a DQ. I think it should even be further punishment for like bans, further tournaments. It's, I think this is yeah, really bad, and it's yeah, it's too. You common. think it's the same situation for IDs? Yeah. Well, so it's a culture. Compar- it's a culture thing. Some games don't allow IDs. Uh, like some mm. games don't allow intentional draws. Some games don't allow drawing. Some games don't don't allow conceding. Um, IDs is like a magic more. It's kind of more of a magic thing because of the way the strength of schedule works. But I've had this. So let's not getting into IDs. I think is a little bit too complicated but for instance there was a situation that happened at one time at the u.s nationals um in flesh and blood and my friend was locked for top eight and he was playing against his opponent and his opponent needed to win to make top eight his opponent asked him to concede first of all they're not on the testing team they're not friends or anything but also his opponent was playing a deck that counters his deck and the entire top eight was pretty much locked, and it was all favorable for him. Also, if you win, you get a higher, sh- you get higher, le- higher place, so you get to pick if you go first or second. Yes, it, like the the there is an advantage. Like the thing is, is like the other player perceived it as a small advantage of the other the other player winning and getting a you know get to pick first or second. But they're like, oh, if I win, I get top eight. That's a huge advantage. So obviously, you should concede to me to give me this plus EV. But it's like it's like no because. At the end of the day, he didn't want to play that deck in top eight because it was a counter to his deck, and he would have lost his initiative to go first or second. But some some players are in those situations. Um, they will like they can get angry, like they can get frustrated with you. But yeah, and they'll make you feel like that. They'd be like, "Well, you sh- you just should. You should just ID because then it's oh. great." And like and they they try and convince. I I had a situation like there was a the tiny tournament I was at literally, and there's people like saying, "Well, you should just ID because it's just great for both of us." When it may, it may not be great for you, yeah. but they'll just fucking be try and convince on that you. Too, but they, even yeah. if it they, was great for both of them, I think yeah. it would still be wrong. Be ca- that's not yeah. the point. Be careful, though. Even it, whether you have a moral issue or not, regardless, be careful if your opponent tells you that to let them win or to ID so that you can both make top eight. <clears throat> There's been so many situations in card games where that person telling you that they've done the math that you guys can both get in, if you they're wrong. <laughs> they're yeah. wrong. And then yeah. you don't make top mm-hmm. eight. Um, so be careful. Be careful about that, uh, for sure. But yeah, it's a coming around to to Moyn's point. I do kind of agree. I think when it comes down to competitive integrity and like, yes, like there there is a thing of like, oh, if it's my friend, if it's if it's your friend, but like, I think okay, it, it's it's it is interesting. It's like if if it's Moyn and Brendan in for the worlds of Lorcana, and it's like, oh, you want to ID so we can both get in. I feel like you guys should play it because, well, either way, like if it, if it were, if it was us three and like you know it's one of us getting in or whatever. Obviously, you're trying to play for yourself. You're trying to get in there and stuff like that. But 
if it was a situation that one of us got in, I I, I know it like come comes down to to different situations stuff like that. But like if one of us gets in, we even talked about it for the Marvel Snap event. If one of us made top eight or whatever, that was kind of a in in my mindset, it's it's a win because yeah, well, it's a team okay. we, we get there. I, I almost, people think differently. I almost you know? never split because splitting is splitting is not sanctioned by the tournament organizers so even if you did split you'd probably be chasing someone down for money they're not obligated to pay you uh, they might be socially obligated to pay you but you might not get paid um and it, that part sucks oh uh, one thing i'll say is like i don't have any skin in the game for like the moral argument of like should you concede should you not should you id should you not what i will say in and this is mostly in regards to people getting angry at you for maybe not conceding no player in a in a match is entitled to the win and some players at- approach the table entitled to the win. And that's why they get angry when they lose, when they lose fairly any any round, or they get angry and you don't concede to them and, so, and it's their top eight winning in. All I can say is don't be that player. Don't be the person that sits down at the table feeling entitled to the win because you suck. You're a loser. <laughs> like You should not think like that. That is, that is toxic and that is incorrect. No player is entitled to winning a match for any reason. Like you can't... I've. I mean, so, yeah, you can't be there be like, oh, I work so much harder or, oh, I get the top eight. If I, you are not entitled. doesn't mean, I again, I'm not skinning the game for the moral argument. Like, should you discuss it? Should you not? But don't be that person that sits down and be entitled to a win. So I'm, I'm very invested in the moral side <laughs> because I, I've, I've, I've seen it too many times and I, I really hate it. So basically what I want to say is, Let's say there are some worlds of Lokana and I'm qualified and you guys are not and you need to beat me to make it there. You have, you have to play. Mm-hmm. And there's no being mad if, if I would be to knock you out. Yeah, of course. I think that... I don't know. I think a lot of people would disagree with you and what I would say yeah, is... Yeah, I like, know. What I would say is that uh, you have to evaluate... Oh, this is going way too deep. But I think you need to evaluate why you play card games. And the reason why I play card games and chase these experiences is not to make uh, plus plus twenty dollars EV, which is like what it will usually equate. It's like some usually these are like infinitesimally small amounts. And you know the reason why I play card games is for the holistic experience to travel, to see my friends, to compete. And when you take away from that experience, um, it sucks. And that's why I I pretty much never split. Pretty much never split. Um, and splitting isn't even IDing. It's not conceding. But because I'm there to compete, like the all the other stuff, like the plus EV here, plus EV there. It doesn't matter to me. And the only split I'll ever agree to, most of the time, is split it all the first. Fuck it. <laughs> but yeah, hit them with that. Whenever people ask you to split, <laughs> you're like, yeah, for sure, all the first. <laughs> 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 they're usually not so keen anymore about the split. <laughs> anyway, it's just. I mean, splitting is just. Usually only incentivized by really bad price structures where um, it's just one one round that will decide for a lot of money where if the pl- price structure was different, no one would be even be asking for a split. So I think a lot of the time it's also a, it's to a degree tournament organizers fault. Mm. Also, to close this out, to be fair, we don't know the rules of Lorcana yet. So it could be against the rules in Lorcana and most games these days, these newer games looks like they're, seem like they're making a lot of this stuff against the rules because the politicking is, is not fun. Um, anyway. All right, let's close it out. And by closing it out, we have a giveaway. So yeah, we asked for reviews to enter here. I didn't look at all. I wasn't looking at the reviews. I looked today to draw. We had, I thought we were going to have five. Uh, we didn't have five. We had 22. So I'm going to pull up the window now. You can see our notes there. Um, and click to spin. These are all the people that left reviews on Apple Podcasts, which is the only one I could pull from. So I'm going to click now. We'll see who wins the Disney Lorcana 100. If you're listening on pod platforms and terribly confused, we're giving away Disney Lorcana 100. Oh, wow. That was pretty close. I feel bad for Luke. Um, it's let's get this bread wins. So if you like, let's get this bread. Hopefully you're watching this week. Please get in contact with me any way possible uh ideally dm me directly on twitter or dm the podcana account or dm both to be honest uh and we're gonna have to figure out a way to verify that this is actually you we'll have to review we'll send this out to you and get it done we appreciate all you guys did i mean it, it really really helped like you can't imagine how much those reviews help in terms of like seo and um uh, and placing and all that stuff so we really really appreciate it anyway if you're listening now and you're like man 
all those people left reviews. I haven't left them yet. And I love this podcast so much. The number one thing you can do is leave us a review. You can do that on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. That also works. Um, it is the number one thing you can do. There's a video version of this on YouTube, like I mentioned, at youtube.com slash at podcast. Hit that subscribe while you're there. We hit over 1K subscribers, which is crazy. Twitter is BrendanAPG, Moin underscore HS, Kawa Tech underscore CG. And thank you all so much. We'll see you next week. Bye.